are so excited about it and why it matters. Um, so over the past uh, four years, I've been studying the ocean here at the University of Arizona. Um, but it wasn't really until this last year that I actually studied the ocean. So what I just said probably makes absolutely no sense. Um, but over the first three years, I studied the ocean, but I studied it in a room with no windows, far uh, from any bodies of water, trapped behind two giant computer screens, <laughs> staring at millions of lines of code, staring at data, staring at spreadsheets. I was studying the ocean, but I was studying the ocean in climate models. But this past summer, I actually was able to get out there in the real ocean, collect actual data. Um, so tonight's talk, I hope to bring together kind of the two worlds I work in, uh, one of ocean modeling and ocean observations. So by the end of this, I hope to bring you guys full circle from understanding why our oceans are so vital to our climate system uh, to understanding the tools that I use to study the ocean. So I'm going to take you from climate models to float-based measurements to boats. So our oceans are extremely important uh, for a variety of reasons. First of which, it gets me out of the desert in the summertime, which is pretty nice. Uh, but really, um, over the past few decades, we've known that our planet has been experiencing an energy imbalance. So that means we've been trapping more and more heat on our planet. And of that excess heat we've been trapping, roughly 93% of it has went into our oceans. So that's a lot of the heat. So we were all sweating today and earlier this week when it was 96 to 97 degrees. Imagine how much more we'd all be sweating right now if our ocean wasn't doing this uh, for us. And on top of that, so it's absorbing a ton of heat in our climate system, but it's also taking up carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So roughly for every four carbon dioxide molecules that we emit into our atmosphere, roughly one of those ends up in our ocean. That's 25%. So what I just told you that we're absorbing all this heat and we're absorbing all of this carbon, it sounds like our oceans are in a, in a sense kind of doing us a big favor, right? But we also know that these things like absorbing all of this heat and taking up all of this carbon dioxide isn't necessarily good for our oceans. So it leads to things like sea level rise, um, when uh, our oceans warm and they expand, and it can screw up the density structure of our ocean, which impacts mixing, and can impact different ocean circulation. And we all know that dumping all that CO2 into our ocean also doesn't really have good impact. So it leads to things like ocean acidification, so actually lowering the pH of our oceans. So our oceans are clearly really important to our climate system here. Um, can anyone think of an example of something that happens in the ocean that directly impacts our climate here in Tucson each year? An ocean phenomena. <laughs> yeah, so El Nino and La Nina. So basically, when that occurs, you're basically shifting where heat is stored in our ocean. And that impacts our uh, climate here, so it impacts our temperatures and our precipitation. And that is because our oceans aren't just static bodies of water sitting there and absorbing all of these properties, but they're actually directly interacting with the atmosphere above us. So they're setting the climate and the weather patterns that we experience, experience right here in Tucson and around the globe every single day. So clearly our oceans are important. So really to me, the key to understanding our past our present and our future climate is to have a really good understanding of how our, what our ocean looks like, so its properties, and how it works, so how its different circulations work, and kind of what controls that. And one way, one tool we can use to get an idea of what our future climate may be is by using uh, climate models. So most of uh, you guys sitting in the audience have probably heard of the term climate models or climate modeling. But what exactly is that? So you've probably heard of it in the terms of what our climate might be in the next coming decades to centuries. Um, but what, are, what is a climate model? So a model is a representation of a system. And in this case, we're representing the entire Earth system in math equations, essentially. So our atmosphere, our ocean, processes on land, and ice processes, we're breaking those down and describing those into a series of equations. 
and principles and laws that have been known for hundreds of years. So I'm talking about things like conservation of energy, conservation of mass, for instance. So we're taking all of that mass, and now we're breaking that down into millions and millions of lines of code which describe how our Earth system works. So how our ocean, our atmosphere, our land, our ice, and how these interact with each other. So you can kind of think of this, what it actually looks like if you were to break the entire planet down into a bunch of what we refer to as grid cells. And in each one of those grid cells, those equations are describing the properties within those cells and how those cells interact with the neighboring cells. And we can run these models forward in time and we can perturb them so we can do things to our atmosphere like say doubling the amount of carbon dioxide or changing the amount of carbon dioxide based on some emission scenario that we might have into the future. Or we can even do things like removing all the mountains. So someone in my lab, Zach Nyman actually, has done some experiments where he's essentially flattened all of our topography to get an idea of how, what are the role of mountains in our climate. So we can do all of these things in climate models as a series of experiments to kind of understand how a climate system works and the different processes that control them. So all this probably sounds extremely complicated and that's because it is. So it's, it is a bunch of scientists, so experts in atmospheric physics, chemistry, biology, ocean chemistry, physics, experts in ice, experts in computer simulations, um, all getting together to work on these models for decades in teams to develop these. So what I want to show you now um, is an example of what this looks like in practice. <laughs> Sorry, we have an issue with the sound. That was the wrong video. This one doesn't have sound. No <laughs> fault. There we go. Um, hold on. Pause it. <laughs> so proud of myself. Okay, all right, so this is a simulation from a model, uh, GFDL CM 2.6, so it's one of the state-of-the-art climate models currently out there in use. And what you're gonna see now, so we don't actually resolve you know, cities and stuff like that, but to give you an idea of what a grid cell looks like, that's New York City. And now we're gonna zoom out, and now the entire ocean has been transformed into those grid cells. So what you're seeing now is sea surface temperature being simulated. So at all those grid cells that were shown, you're seeing those equations being solved in time. So this is not observations you're staring at. This is actually math, which is pretty cool. Um, so, you, so you can see the, uh, the warm, salty water being transported northward in the Gulf Stream. And you can see the colder water from the Arctic traveling south. So this is beautiful and this is fantastic, but how do we know that this is actually what the real Earth ocean looks like? So we want models that represent our climate system, right? So we need to be comparing these models against observations. So that's what I do for my PhD work. So this is, a, so that was the models part of the talk. So now we're gonna go into the floats and boats side of things. Uh, so this summer, I actually got to go out on a 46 day cruise. So I was traveling from Sydney, Australia, all the way to Papiete, Tahiti. So along that red line, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So I was out there for 46 days, and it was part of this big international effort. So it was part of the United States Go Ship operation. But it is really a big international collaboration to get out there into our oceans decade after decade and measure their properties at the same locations from the surface all the way to the bottom of the ocean. But they're not just important for the ship-based measurements, but they're also important because these are where we deploy these big yellow things next to me called floats. So my role on this ship was to help with the deployment of floats and help with the day-to-day ship-based measurements. So what exactly is this? giant yellow thing next to me. So this is what we refer to as an Argo profiling float. So all those black dots up there is the location of one of these floats currently in our ocean. So we have about four, a little under 4,000, 3,800 of these 
out there currently roaming our oceans completely on their own, kind of acting like uh, little robots in a sense, collecting data. So what all these uh, floats are collecting data on is our temperature, our salinity, and pressure in our ocean from the surface to about 2,000 meters. So inside this big yellow cylinder is all of those sensors. And how these work is you basically deploy them off the side of a, uh, side of a boat. So, uh, yeah, so you deploy these off the side of a boat. So there's me standing next to a special one, which I'll talk about in a little bit, uh, but they're about the size of me or a foot taller. <laughs> And so we dump them into the ocean and they have a battery inside of them that's programmed to last roughly five to seven years and they also have a bladder inside of them. And what that does is it allows this float to travel from the surface, sink to about a thousand meters depth, collecting data the entire way. And then, and then once it gets to a thousand meters, it'll sink to 2,000 meters and rise back to the surface and it's collecting data that entire time. So it just keeps cycling roughly every 10 days. So this is a picture of me deploying one of these floats off the side. So I was really thankful that out there we had marine technicians because these things are like the size of me. And it's pretty scary actually being out there. So this was during the day, uh, but being out there in the middle of the night kind of hanging off the side of a boat trying to carefully drop this thing into an ocean when it's about the size of you. Um, and this is actually one of those uh, more specialized floats. So there's this program going on here as a collaboration between University of Arizona, Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of Washington, Princeton, a whole bunch more uh, universities which you'll see as a bunch of a mess of logos on the acknowledgement slide, but it's called SOCOM. So it's Southern Ocean Carbon Climate Observation and Modeling Program. And basically, they have developed these new floats. So my advisor is sitting in the back, Joellen. She is the lead on the modeling end. Uh, and they, <laughs> they have developed these brand new floats, um, which actually, so the other floats can't go under ice. These ones can. So they have special software that allows them to go under ice and sense the changes in salinity basically says, don't go up any further, go back down before you bump into the ice. So now we're getting a view of what our ocean looks like under ice, which wasn't possible with just these floats. And these floats here, the SOCOM ones, are also collecting data on pH, nitrates, and oxygen in our ocean. So we're really getting to see what the biogeochemistry looks like in our oceans. So, uh, yeah, so now there's a float out there with a giant U of A symbol on it, floating around for the next five to seven years. And uh, yeah, so I wanted to make a shout out to any teachers or anyone who works with teachers in here. So the reason we decorated this float is because there's this program called Adopt-A-Float through SOCOM, <laughs> which local uh, school groups and classrooms can actually adopt one of these floats. And they get to tell the scientists on board, whoever's deploying it, how to decorate it, whatever they want to name it. And then they're given the number of that float. And now they can track it around the ocean. And there's a bunch of activities uh, that they can do with that to learn about how our ocean works and the ocean currents. But so this one, by the time we got out there, wasn't adopted. So we all decided we would adopt it ourselves. So everyone got to write, write and draw something on it. And now we can all track it around ourselves. So we deployed this one. So this is a map of all those SOCOM floats in the Southern Ocean. And the box and the white dot in it is where that float is and where it has traveled since July 29th of this past summer when we deployed it. And to give you an idea of what the data looks like from these, what you're looking at here is sea surface temperature measured from roughly the surface down to about 1,500 meters. So that's that float, the one with the U of A symbol on it. Uh, it has cycled up and down roughly 25 times so far. And all of this data, when it gets to the surface, it's pinged back to that satellite. And this data is publicly available within hours of it being collected. So anyone can go in there, analyze it. So there's a ton of people using this data. But it's kind of fun to track where the U of A float is floating around our ocean. So float-based measurements are great because they give us a global picture. So right, you saw the 
map with all the dots, so that's kind of a global picture of what our oceans look like, with roughly 4,000 of them out there. But if you remember me saying, they only go down to 2,000 meters. So on average, our ocean is about 4,000 meters deep. That's an average. There's places that are much, much more deeper than that. So with these floats, while they're giving us a global picture, they're really only letting us see about half of the ocean. So what we really need to do is complement these with ship-based measurements. So these ship-based measurements have been going on since the early 1950s. So each one of these lines on here is a cruise through United States Go Ship operation that is either uh, waiting to go or has gone over these past few years. And the idea is you return to these same places in the ocean and you sample this water from the surface to the bottom of the ocean roughly every half a degree of longitude or even finer resolution than that all the way across the ocean. So this is where my ship was. So how do we actually do this? I keep saying we're going from the surface to the bottom of the ocean, but how do we actually get these measurements? So we deploy this cage of instruments essentially that we refer to as a CTD rosette so conductivity, temperature, depth recorder is the main instrument on here. And conductivity gives us our uh, salinity of our oceans. But surrounding, and there's an array of other instruments on there that can measure fluorescence, that can measure direct velocity measurements, things like that. But surrounding all those instruments is an array of 36 bottles that are roughly as tall as me. So they're honestly probably the size of this float next to me. And the idea here is, we deploy this thing, the CPD rosette, over the side of the boat. And when we do this, all the bottles are cocked open on the top and the bottom by a spring system. And we lower this thing from the surface all the way to roughly five meters from the bottom. So my job on this ship was to prepare this thing and make sure we didn't lose it or hit the bottom, which is extremely stressful when you've never done this before. Because uh, that would be a lot of money essentially sitting at the bottom of the ocean. It's the worst thing that can happen on a cruise. Um, but yeah, so we, we put this in the ocean and I essentially sit behind a desk in another room. And I uh, yeah, I went to the ocean to try and get away from computers, but most of my time spent out there staring at a computer. Uh, but uh, we put this thing down and I sit behind a desk with a walkie-talkie, radioing to the person operating a giant cable uh, with this thing hanging off on it, and I basically tell them when to deploy it, how fast to deploy it, and I sit there and I just stare at numbers for three, four hours. Uh, luckily, you have a partner that you work with, so you can kind of take a break, but you're looking for things like spikes in tension, you don't want a wave to come through, and then all of a sudden this thing snaps, uh, things like that. And then when it gets close to the bottom, I basically radio, and I would say all stop, stand by. And that was by far the most stressful part of my job. And then I would do what's called firing a bottle. And from this computer screen in front of me, I would click a button, and firing a bottle means I'm snapping those lids on the bottle shut. So bottle number 36 would snap shut, and it would trap all of that water in there. So now we're talking about water that's roughly 4,000, 6,000 meters into the ocean completely trapped inside of one of those bottles. And then I would radio them to bring up to the next surface and we continue the entire way to we basically end up with 36 samples from the bottom all the way to the top of the ocean. So these are pictures of the CCD kind of hanging off the side of the boat, but you can see the bottles and you can see the array of instruments. But I wanted to show you guys a cool video. This one has sound, Nicole. Okay, say one. Thank you. 
repeat this process 300 times or more <laughs> across the entire Pacific Ocean, day in, day out, on 12-hour shifts. So it's a so yes, yeah, so what I've described is probably doesn't sound like the most exciting um, cruise to be on because yeah, you're doing literally the same thing every single day. So I wake up. I wake up at midnight every time, midnight to noon shift. I wake up at midnight and I know either I'm gonna start sitting behind a computer or I'm gonna have to immediately rush into the sample room and start collecting samples from these 36 bottles and that could take up to an hour or more in itself. Um, and there'd be some days where you'd be working 12 hours straight, no breaks at all, because by the time you collected all that data, the ship move into the next station. And then you're on the next station, so you're rushing to prepare this thing and send it back down again, and then you're sitting there for another four hours staring at numbers. But it's extremely, so it doesn't sound you know, that exciting, and I only, you know, I got entertainment out of watching an occasional bird that would come by in the afternoon. There wasn't much to look at. But it's extremely, extremely important uh, research that needs to be done. So here's us kind of uh, keeping track of our samples and honestly kind of counting down to whenever we hit uh, Tahiti. <laughs> But the idea here is, like I said, it's, ex it's boring, but it's extremely important. It's extremely important because this is the only way we get high resolution data from the surface all the way to the bottom of our ocean. So what you're shown on the top here, each one of those dots, which may be kind of blurred in the lines for you guys right now, is actually a sample we collected at a certain depth. So the idea here is to get this bottom picture a complete picture of our ocean's properties. So we're analyzing things like the salinity of our ocean, the temperature of our ocean, the oxygen content, the carbon, the dissolved organic carbon, inorganic carbon, pH, everything, different isotopes, everything you can possibly think of to get this picture of what our ocean currently looks like. And we're doing this every decade, right? So we're, this is the only way we can really measure how our oceans are changing. So we can compare this to the last time they did the same cruise in the same location. But it's also important because I use this data for my work to compare climate model simulations against. So I wanted to end this section on a video I uh, actually made um, from my journey this past summer. So it kind of summarizes everything I just described in words so you'll see you know, the CTD going in, you'll see everyone kind of rushing in and going around sampling, and you also see really beautiful pictures of Australia uh, and the ocean. a bunch of albatross, which was actually uh, pretty cool. But yeah, so it was a really exciting project to be a part of. 
and it provides me and every other person studying the ocean and using climate models with extremely useful data. And that is because, like I said in the beginning, in order to build confidence in our model simulations and our projections of future climate, we need to have confidence that these models can accurately sim simulate the observed world, in this case, the observed oceans. So these uh, observations, whether it be ship-based measurements or float-based measurements, give us a method by which we can benchmark these climate models and determine which models maybe do things more accurately and which ones don't. So it's actually, it's really important work, and that's what my work here as a PhD student focuses on. So getting my hands on as much observer, observational data as possible and comparing that data to state-of-the-art climate models that are currently being used to project our future climate. So I just wanted to show one slide. I'm not gonna go into the details of what exactly this is, but you guys can see how I'm actually using this data. So this is an example of um, a current a circulation in the Atlantic Ocean that we've been observing uh, since the early 2000s. So most of my research thus far is focused on circulation in the Atlantic, uh, but I'm now switching gears to the Southern Ocean, so I'll start to get use some of the data that was actually um, collected. But all the way on the left, that big black bar, is the measurement of the strength of that circulation from observations. Each one of those blue bars there is the same thing, but as simulated in a climate model. So this is what I do. You can get the idea that some models you know, simulate things more accurately and some don't. So the gray shading behind there, you can think it's the overlap, it's the spread, uh, or the range that we observe this current, so the strength of it. And we can see that some of the blue bars overlap better than other ones. So this is the whole idea behind what I do. Basically taking an observation, whether it be floats, whether it be ship-based, whether it be a certain array in the ocean, and comparing climate models against it to see how the models compare against the real world. So this is providing information that allows us to build confidence in our model projection, but also we're always advancing our climate models. So these teams that are making these climate models, they want to know what they do best and what they don't do as well, so they can continuously improve their models and get a more realistic picture, which will lead to better predictions in the short term and or better projections in the long term. So I want to wrap this up by showing this slide. Uh, so this is my acknowledgement slide, but it kind of tells the story of this has kind of involved so many institutions, so many different people, just the big mess at the top, all those logos, are part of that SOCOM project. So the modeling end of, here, end of it here is going on at the University of Arizona. There's Scripps Institute of Oceanography, University of Miami, Rutgers, also NASA, NOAA, the NSF. Tons of different people all trying to get these observations, build better models, compare models against these observations. So it's a really big undertaking and I'm really happy to be part of it and it's a really exciting time to be in this field where we're generating all of this data on a daily, hourly basis if we think about the floats, how quick we get that. And yeah, and I want to thank again U of A Carson Scholars Program and Borderlands and thank all of you for coming out to listen to me talk about oceans. Thank you.